Good afternoon, and I want to welcome you all to this uh, distinguished lectureship that's sponsored by uh, the RESPECT Center, the Research and Palliative End of Life um, Communication and Training Center, and also by the Fairbanks uh, Center for Ethics. And we're just thrilled to have this partnership in bringing Dr. Betty Farrell here to speak with us. Uh, today we've had a wonderful two days of uh, meetings with her with many people and I'm just thrilled for you all to be able to hear her she's truly an incredible person Betty's been a friend of mine for many many years we were actually on faculty at the University of Oklahoma way way back I can't even remember what years that was in the, in the early 80s and um, and then we both moved away from Oklahoma at the same time I went to Arizona and she went to um, uh, City of Hope in, in Duarte. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her background, but to know from the very beginning and since I've ever known her, Betty is one of those people who is a very, very special person because she's a wonderful listener and uh, and puts with that listen listening the in action what she sees as important to do to address and have the compassion to take that next step and address things and that's kind of been the way I've watched her career over very many 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 years and it's just a a, a dear friend and but also an amazing person to watch as what she's done I'm going to read you a little bit about her bio and then um, tell you a few other things about her. Uh, uh, Betty has been in oncology for 35 years and is focused on the clinical expertise and research in pain management, quality of life, and palliative care. She is a professor and research scientist at City of Hope in Los Angeles. She's a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing, and get this, she has over 300 publications in peer-reviewed journals and texts. She is principal investigator of a pro program project uh, funded by the National Cancer Institute on Palliative Care for Quality of Life and Symptom Concerns in Lung Cancer. She's an investigator of the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium Project. And uh, that's, many of you know that as the ELNEC project um, that has now uh, in being delivered and taught in 74 countries around the globe. 74, right? Uh, so the impact that she has is not just in the United States, but globally. She directs several other funded projects related to palliative care and centers and quality of life issues. She's a member of the Board of Scientific Advisors for the National Cancer Institute and is chairperson of the National Consensus Pro Project for Quality Palliative Care. She's authored eight books, uh, and uh, the topics of those are related to pain, suffering, pain in the elderly, palliative nurse care nursing. She's co-author of other texts, The Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Nursing. And she's also uh, has a master's degree. One of these things that I just recently found out about Betty that she realized that um, spiritual care is such an important part of uh, uh, palliative care at end of life. And so she thought, you know, I don't need, know enough about that to guide our uh, clinical folks in that. Went back and got a master's of theology, ethics, and culture from Claremont University uh, in 2007. So um, and a truly amazing person, and I know you're going to so much enjoy hearing what she has to say today. So please welcome her. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very, very honored to be here. I've had the great opportunity for these two days to meet one-on-one -on -one with uh, your colleagues across a various profession, and I'm extremely impressed at the level of scholarship and the wonderful interdisciplinary work and very inspired by uh, your uh, postdoctoral students and good doctoral students and all of the, the next generation of researchers. So you've, you've got a incredibly impressive group of uh, people here doing important work and it's been my honor to be here. I've learned from each of you each hour. Uh, I uh, was interacting with the people planning this event and was asked what I you know, might share and we talked about a few different topics and came upon this idea of sharing some of our work in improving the quality of spiritual care as something that's probably a little different and uh, I will share with you the work that we're doing now, and I'll also 
uh, make sure to save some time for discussion because I think this is a topic that lends itself to uh, people sharing their thoughts and their activities, and so I hope we can have some interaction along the way. Um, I have talked to many people, and I know that you're doing a lot of work in your uh, center and in your hospitals here in the area of palliative care, and certainly with the aging population, with the demands and changes ahead in healthcare systems, with the growing number of chronic and serious illness, all of us will be involved in palliative care. And yet, my experience has been that we say we embrace palliative care, and we say philosophically that palliative care is whole person care, that we should be caring for physical and psychological and social and spiritual needs. But my experience is often that spiritual care or attention to spirituality kind of gets put back on the back burner. Uh, and I think that happens in research and it happens in clinical practice where as palliative care teams call to see a patient who is in tremendous distress in every realm um, and the palliative care team meets, but often there's this urgency of, gee, why don't we just get the nurse practitioner and the doctor to go see the patient and get all the symptoms under control and then we'll get back with the rest of you, right? Um, or we're doing our research and we become overwhelmed and say, yes, it's true, we know that these are whole people and that spirituality is a part of their being, but gosh, this is getting too complicated. You know, why don't we just limit this study to the psychological? Um, and so there are so many reasons why while most of us would say, yes, spirituality is important, it also, the reality that I see is that spirituality often gets sort of set to the side, we don't quite get to it, we don't embrace it as, as fully as we should, and for many, many reasons, I think there's, there are great opportunities for us to change that and to do a much better job. So the work that I've been doing in this area of improving the quality of spiritual care, uh, really focused on palliative care has come in part um, from many things. One is because I chair the National Consensus Project for Palliative Care, which is the collection of all the palliative care organizations who collectively create the clinical practice guidelines. And these are the guidelines that have now informed the Joint Commission for their certification in palliative care, the National Quality Forum, um, accountable care organizations, so many structures that will now be certifying and identifying the quality of care that we hope to be reimbursed for. Um, and one of those domains is spiritual care. And so one of the things that I say, and I think joint commission and payers and accountable care organizations and certifying bodies will be saying is, where's the spiritual care? And what is the quality of the spiritual care you're providing? So I do think that there is very important for us to ask ourselves the question, what is the quality of spiritual care that we are providing? And sort of my mantra as I'm talking to palliative care programs and hospice programs even is, unless you are providing quality spiritual care, you are not providing quality palliative care. You can't leave this out. You, know, you cannot say people are whole people and spirituality is an important part of them and then move forward and ignore spirituality. And so I, I hope that becomes your mantra and because I think it really is the message that if you are not providing quality spiritual care, you are not providing quality palliative care or quality patient-centered care. And so <clears throat> I want to share with you the work that uh, I've been involved with, and uh, today I've opted to sort of focus on one particular project, which is a project by the same title, and it's work that we have done at City of Hope, where I work, which is the NCI-designated Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, in California, and uh, funded through the Archstone Foundation, and our partner in this first uh, component I'm sharing with you has been GWISH. GWISH is the George Washington University Institute for Spirituality and Health, located in Washington, D.C., and Dr. Christina Polchowski is a physician who has done a tremendous amount 
for trying to improve the integration of spiritual care into medical school curriculum and a very strong advocate for spiritual care within health care. So these are our partners in uh, beginning this project. So I want to talk to you today about opportunities for improving the quality of spiritual care as a component of palliative care, help you think about key areas of quality spiritual care, and describe clinical guidelines which have been developed to support clinicians in improving spiritual care. Uh, the project team for this first work that we did, I just want to acknowledge as, as every good project I've heard about as I've been here today, is always interdisciplinary and is always the work of many, many people. And so uh, at City of Hope, I have many colleagues who are a part of this and help with this, and also at GW, uh, Christina and her colleagues there within the Spirituality Institute have been uh, vital. We also called on many colleagues, and so people like Harvey Chachanoff, some of you are familiar with his work as a psychiatrist in uh, Canada, and Harvey has done much of the current work around dignity therapy, focusing on things such as uh, le leaving legacy, finding meaning and purpose in life. Um, and has created some very clinically uh, useful approaches to dignity therapy at end-of-life care. Holly Nelson-Becker, who is a social worker, whose scholarship is in spiritual care, uh, uh, chaplain Karen Puglisi uh, in Illinois. George Hanzo is with the uh, um, Healthcare Chaplaincy, which is the leading organization in New York City. And interestingly, just a couple months ago, Healthcare Chaplaincy has now announced that they are in the process of creating board certification for chaplains in palliative care, which I think, again, is one more important step forward. We have board certification for nurses and physicians in uh, palliative care, and so it will be a good thing that we have chaplains who are board certified in palliative care. Mary Jo Prince-Paul, who is a nurse researcher in uh, Case Western, and she's done some very important uh, work around relational communication and the overlap between social uh, well-being and spiritual well-being. So she's done a lot of work around primarily spousal uh, communication and relationships at the end of life. Uh, and Dancel Macy, who many of you may know, who is a uh, priest and a physician and again, has done a lot of work around the integration of spiritual care in health care. <clears throat> so the background of this work is that we know the goal of palliative care is to prevent and relieve suffering. We know that palliative care supports the best possible quality of life for patients and their families, and that palliative care is viewed as applying to patients from the time of diagnosis of serious illness until death. And so... I, like many of you in the room, I began my career 35 years ago in 1977. Uh, people could barely say the word hospice. There were zero hospices in my state. Um, the word palliative care did not exist, and there was no such thing as a palliative care team or unit. And so fast forward, we now have 5,000 hospice programs in the United States. We have had the development of palliative care as a specialty. Um, the latest statistics for the Center to Advance Palliative Care tell us that now close to over 70% of hospitals, more than 200 beds, have a, a formal palliative care service. And so the world has changed, and for many good reasons. Uh, demographic reasons with our aging population, important economic issues as we as a system and a society begin to really ask questions about how we can spend such a high percentage of our global economy on health care, issues of futility, um, and really what is the best way to provide high quality care to people who are seriously ill and dying. And so palliative care will continue to grow. And of course, here in your city and across the country, we're seeing wonderful opportunities to have palliative care integrated into all disease-focused care. There are models coming up uh, everywhere showing how palliative care can be well integrated in cardiology and can change the way that end-of-life uh, end care happens for people with heart failure. We're seeing tremendous integration in pulmonary disease, in uh, certainly across cancer diagnoses, in critical care units, in long-term care, 
um, for the growing population of those with dementias. So in every unit, in every patient population, from neonatal intensive care through geriatrics, palliative care is becoming a more and more prominent part of our health care. But the real question is, where does spiritual care fit within this growing field of palliative care? And what can you and I do to ensure that, in fact, if we say we deliver good palliative care, we are, in fact, delivering good spiritual care? <laughs> So our initial project, we received funding from the Archstone Foundation, and the goal of this initial funding was that we wanted to convene a consensus meeting, and we wanted to bring together 40 leaders from across the country, and the 40 leaders were intended to represent both the field of palliative care and across disciplines, so nurses, doctors, social workers, chaplains, all kinds of people in healthcare, and we also wanted to then bring in um, leaders in the field of spirituality, so theologians, spiritual directors, uh, ordained clergy across uh, religious groups, so a wide variety of people uh, representing religion, spirituality, health care, across settings, across disciplines. So bring together 40 people in the areas of palliative care and spiritual care and see if we could come together and identify points of agreement about spirituality as it applies to health care. <clears throat> One of our goals that isn't exactly uh, here was we had planned that we wanted a goal to see if these 40 people could come together and come up with a shared definition that all 40 of us could agree on of spirituality, which in itself was pretty monumental, and I had serious doubts that we would really leave uh, with a shared definition with 40 people, all chosen because they had strong opinions and uh, represented some group. So if if there's evidence that prayer works. Believe me, I was praying uh, that this could really happen. Um, our goal was to make recommendations that could advance the delivery of spiritual care and palliative care. And we started with five key elements. Uh, we started this process saying that we, uh, we thought the five elements would be spiritual assessment, what should happen in terms of spiritual assessment, models of care and, and care plans, meaning once we assess or find out something about patient spirituality, how can that make its way into the plan of care and not just be written down and ignored? Um, what about interprofessional team training? What is it that we as the non-spiritual care providers, as the nurse, the doctor, the social worker, what do we need to know if we are to be competent in this area? Um, what about quality improvement? In the exact same way that we should be do qual doing quality improvement, how many patients have fallen this month in your hospital? How many nosocomial infections? Well, how many people who died had chaplaincy involved? Um, for what percent of patients did we take the time on admission to find out um, their spiritual needs, their religious affiliations, what rituals might be important, what beliefs and values they hold? Um, so we should be doing ongoing quality improvement in the area of spiritual care because if you believe it's important and if you believe you should be providing quality care, then there is no other way to achieve that unless you have ongoing quality quality improvement efforts in this area. And what personal and professional development is needed? Um, there have been a series of studies uh, which are done over time which give healthcare providers often across discipline a list of here are things that you are required to do in the healthcare setting and sort of what are you most and least comfortable at. And so um, these surveys often list things like addressing spiritual needs, assessing sexuality, working with diverse populations, etc. So one of my motivations in this work was a few years ago, I re realized that every recent survey had documented that we are now at a place where all healthcare providers reported they were much more comfortable in talking with patients about sexuality than spirituality. And that's when I knew we were in deep trouble, right? <laughs> Um, good for sexuality, not so good for spirituality. Um, but, but uh, and in fact, there's really important work that has documented that the problem is actually escalating, and that 
people in 2012, healthcare providers in 2012, are actually less confident and comfortable uh, talking about spirituality than they were in 2011, than they were in 2010. Does anyone want to venture? Why? I mean, this should not be, right? We're always looking for progress. Why do you think that um, that people may be less comfortable in dealing with spirituality in 2012? Anyone want to venture? So less personal religious affiliation then means that our workforce and healthcare are people who don't have that religious connection, and so right, absolutely, that's a very important point. Anyone else? Why would why would we be doing worse and less comfortable with spirituality in 2012? The diversity, right, exactly. I always tell nurses, you know, uh, assessment of spirituality, my whole career was when you're doing that checklist of how old are you, who do you live with, what medicines do you take, religion, and we had that short list, and the short list said, are you Baptist, are you Catholic, are you, you know, Methodist, and then there was that blank line that said other, and I lived in fear as a nurse, please do not say other, right? Right. <laughs> And so now that we have in our daily settings people who are Buddhist, people who are Muslim, people who are uh, who are atheist, people who come from religions you have never heard of, then the diversity itself makes life more challenging. And one last, there's one last uh, uh, factor that is a huge factor that that, that I'm wondering if you'll hit on. I'll tell you, and that is, do you want to say, yeah. Normally, you would talk about more like a separation. Mm-hmm. You know, religion. Yeah. Very good. So there's often, and certainly I would say this is alive and well in students, medical students, nursing students. Oh, no, I'm I'm here for the body and the health care, and I'm not asking, and that's I need to stay away, right, the separation. And the last issue that's, I think, very important is in, that in the that as, as the world has changed, we know that many of the world events, much of the strife, uh, you know, war, politics, in fact, are related to world religions. And so what has happened is that we as healthcare providers, we have just admitted this patient in front of us who is Muslim, the patient who is um, Jewish, the patient whose faith is very different than my own, and I am terrified. I am terrified that I'm going to say something that is going to be terribly offensive. I I don't know what to say. I and so I I have this sense that to say nothing is probably the best thing to do. So th- these are all important factors that influence why in fact most healthcare providers are doing a really bad job when it comes to spiritual assessment or integration of spirituality. Yes. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and in fact, you know, most nurses, most nursing students, most medical students, part of their training is that they practice and they are given the script for and they are assessed that you need to know how to do uh, to assess your patient's sexuality, right? You you go into the clinical setting with those tools, you practice it, you get feedback. And few nursing students, medical students, you know, probably a little better with social work and some other disciplines, but we do not have that skill. We do not. Other than the short checklist, give me a quick answer, and I hope it's nothing weird. That's the mindset, um, honestly. That's what students say. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so this was our work, and this is what we hope to do. As I mentioned before, the framework for this project was the National Consensus Project Guidelines of what constitutes quality palliative care, and so what you see is that there are eight domains of quality palliative care, and one of those entire domains is spiritual, religious, and existential, which is why, again, I reinforce that if you say you have a palliative care program, then you cannot wipe out one of eight domains and decide to not address it, right? Um, What I would also say, though, is as I look up at this slide, what I am reminded of is that spirituality, in my mind, transcends every domain. That 
pers the patient's expression of their pain and of their symptoms is very much influenced by their religious or spiritual beliefs. One's psychological and psychiatric aspects, one's depression, mood, anxiety, expression of emotion are influenced by one's spirituality. And we could go on down the list. And certainly cultural aspects are vastly you know, related to spirituality. So I don't I, I, I think we can't justify throwing out a whole domain and ignoring it, but I also think that you're not going to do justice to any of the domains unless you're paying good attention to spirituality. I have to share with you one little funny moment. When we were doing our consensus conference and we had these 40 people um, gathered together, leaders in their fields, and um, there was a little tension, and we mostly didn't know each other. And at one of the first breaks, we had a little coffee break, and I happened to sort of wander in. I was standing in this circle, and in this circle there was a chaplain, two psychiatrists, and three theologians. And they were just sort of introducing themselves, And but there was this sort of cagey, I'm not sure who you are and what this is going to be. Um, and about then, one of the psychiatrists um, pointed to the, one of the theologians and said, well, let me just come out and say it. The things that you guys call spiritual experiences, well, we have a DSM-3 diagnosis. <laughs> we diagnose this, we try to fix it, and we bill for it. Um, and I thought, I'm really glad you, I mean, that's the truth. And that is the truth, that one of the huge issues we have to face is that we in healthcare come upon spirituality in the same way that we do other acts of our care, which is... Um, it's all about a problem, and I need to diagnose it, give it a number, and fix it. And much of what spiritual care has to teach us is that our job is really not about fixing, nor do we really do that very often. Um, and it also should be about a tremendous appreciation for the individual and their spirituality. Um, and our job is to honor and respect and to ensure that people get the kind of care that honors their spirituality. But um, this was the, the framework. So th these next couple slides are, are kind of fine print, but the point I wanted to make here is to say that when we finished the National Consensus Project guidelines on quality spiritual care in the first edition, which I think was uh, uh, 2004, we then were told that if you really wanted to impact quality, the next thing that you needed to do was that you needed to then go to the National Quality Forum and you needed to get some high-level national group like the National Quality Forum to endorse your guidelines um, because that would be sort of the step of really leading to certification and accreditation and financing and lots of other important things. And so we were, we were advised to go to the National Quality Forum. And when we went to the National Quality Forum, we were first told, well, there are about 200 groups in line in front of you uh, because there's all kinds of people, you know, the diabetes folks and the cardiology folks and the ED people and the everybody who also have guidelines and who are also trying to define and promote quality at this era in healthcare, And so, you know, kind of take a number. And so it was but a few weeks later that I got a call as a chair of the guidelines saying, um, you've just been moved to the front of the line. And um, and the NCP basically said, you know what, there is diabetes and heart disease and all of these things, but what you're doing in palliative care covers all diagnoses and is really important, and we really need this in what's ahead in health care. The world needs palliative care, the health care system needs palliative care, so could you come on up? And so we were there, and they invited a handful of us on the NCP committee to actually serve on the National Quality Forum. And so the task, I had no clue in the universe what I was doing or what the National Quality Forum was, but, um, but our, our task was then, what their work was to help us take these global guidelines, these sort of conceptual notions like you see in the first uh, what I'm trying to show you here is our guideline was spiritual and existential dimensions are assessed and responded to. Best on, uh, based on best available evidence, which is skillfully and systematically applied. And then through the work of the National Quality Forum, what they, their task was to develop preferred practices, meaning what are sort of operational 
uh, measurable things that a, a group, um, an accrediting group, a certifying group, a paying group that could go in and then look for what is that, what would that look like, how would we know if it happened kind of thing. And so, in fact, that was the work of the National Quality Forum was to take our global ideas and move them into preferred practices. And so, in fact, Again, I didn't know that this could be done, but we were able to do it. And so, uh, again, I reinforce that that good spiritual care is in it, it has a very special place, um, and is sometimes difficult to quantify. And there is there is much uh, that is different, but it also there is much that is very similar when it comes to assuring quality care. So these 40 leaders um, <clears throat> developed. We did come together. We What we basically did was before the conference, we had drafted the guidelines. We had sent them out to these 40 leaders. We gave them plenty of time to review them and give us feedback. We revised the entire document based on their feedback. We invited them to come together. The goal was to come together, to have an opening session where we would review what were all the things that everyone seemed to agree on. And then we had this short list of things that people didn't agree on at all. And so at that point, the goal was to lock people into rooms and tell them they could not come out or be fed until they came to consensus. So um, so honestly, that we really did need to hammer out, so what do you mean by spiritual assessment? And who does it? And so there were some things that we did need to get uh, agreement on. And then make recommendations, and we needed to then identify resources to help people to do this work. And so that was the um, that was the work, and that was the process. And these were the people who all came together. And I share this that we're still all standing together, and and seem to be getting along. And the process uh, did in fact happen. And so the next slide that I have to share with you is something I, I'd like you to look at carefully and think about for a moment. And I would like to hear a couple of responses about it. So this is, in fact, the shared definition that the whole group came to consensus around about what is spirituality. And so it says, spirituality is the aspect of humanity that refers to the way individuals seek and express meaning and purpose and the way they experience their connectiveness to the moment, to self, to others, to nature, and to the significant or sacred. So any thoughts from you about what you think about the definition as you think about the people you serve? Um, does this, how does this definition seem to you or do we miss anything or anything you'd want to disagree with? But it's the development of the ways that people do that is their spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's lots of terminology, you know, yeah. spirituality, spiritual well-being, spiritual perspective. And then, of course, the, the related, you know, the concepts of religion, religiosity, faith, et cetera. Um, uh, so it's, it is, you know, this is not easy, you know, to think about. And certainly, you know, who knows if this is the right or perfect definition. And probably like all things a few years from now, we'll know more. And who knows? But, I, but it's been the definition that has, um, has been now. Uh, so what year was this? Like 2009, I think about three years. And so it's been very interesting to me to see, you know, how it's sort of taken on a life and found its way in many places. And um, yeah, the, <clears throat> many, many people, as we were discussing what the definition should be, we just sort of had person after person after person who said, you know, every day I see patients who say, I'm not really religious, but I'm very spiritual. And we see lots of people who say, um, all I want is, can you please get me in a wheelchair and roll me outside and let me feel the sun on my face? And so people were very interested in the sort of connectiveness to the universe and the idea of, you know, connectiveness to nature seem to be really important elements. So, <clears throat> okay, so you can keep thinking about that or maybe at the end if anyone wants to comment further about that. 
Um, so after the conference, we synthesized all the feedback and uh, revised the consensus report. And we then, one of the interesting things is we really weren't thinking about doing an external peer review because we had 40 people brought together who had done a pre-review, a writing, a post-review. you know, review. But we had people all over the country calling us saying, uh, can I come, you know, before the conference, and then uh, can I get your report, et cetera. So we decided, uh, because we felt so terrible having to turn away all these people, that we sort of decided that all the people who wanted to come to the conference and couldn't, we would at least send them the draft after the uh, conference so they could at least feel like they were participating in some way and give us feedback. And so we actually had 91 people who had contacted us, who, who you know, just because they heard this was going on, who, we had more than that, but, but uh, 91 actually got the document, did a thorough review, gave us feedback, and sent it back. And so that was really encouraging that there is this great ownership and that many people want to see this kind of work. Um, the, our final report was published in the Journal of Palliative Medicine, and there was so much information that we couldn't possibly fit it into just the journal, and so we wrote a book. And so the book is published by Templeton Press um, called Making Health Care Whole, Integrating Spirituality into Patient Care. So to summarize, what did the what were the recommendations? What do we think needs to happen? And so we started uh, with five areas and expanded to seven areas. And so I'm just going to do a quick touching base on what these recommendations are about. Um, the first is uh, spiritual care models, and the recommendations are that uh, that spiritual care should be integral to any patient-centered healthcare system. Um, that it is based on honoring dignity that spiritual distress needs to be treated the same as any other medical problem, that spirituality should be considered a vital sign, and that spiritual care has to be interdisciplinary. Um, and basically, I think what we're aiming for here is what are the structures that we can put in place to ensure that spiritual assessment, spiritual care happens? I think that's the real issue. Um, <clears throat> We know very often that in healthcare settings, uh, let's say where I work in a lot, oncology, the patient who's newly diagnosed, the 40-year-old woman who's just been told she has breast cancer, she has just been admitted to the oncology unit, the nurse that's going through and saying, how old are you and who do you live with and what other diagnoses do you have and what is your religion, but then that nurse who also knows she's just heard the words, you have breast cancer, the nurse may very well say, and would you like to see the chaplain? And what you also all know is that it is a very high percentage of time that the person will say no. And why do patients say no when asked if they want to see a chaplain? Anyone? They with death. It's right. They associate with death. They are saying, oh, no, I'm not signing up for that plan. I'm here for the please cure me and get me out of here quick. That is not the see the chaplain road, right? All right. Other reasons? Uh, they're uncomfortable talking with religion with a stranger and who knows what kind of chaplains they have here. And, you know, I'm a, a born and raised cradle Baptist, and what if they send some Catholic in here to talk to me, right? There's like the greatest fears happen, right, when you ask that question, do you want to see a chaplain, right? Right, absolutely. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, chaplain means I'm in trouble, I'm weak, I need help. Um, they think I'm crazy already, right? Yeah, yes. They're also angry. And so they're angry at God or who right. they believe in. Yeah. Because that's who he's representing. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so when they mm -hmm. Exactly. God is that. Like, oh no. You know, if God was paying attention, I wouldn't be here, right? I had a patient a while back on my studies who said, I am taking a little break from God. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hedging her bets, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but so there's, there are many reasons. But, like, God is clearly not paying attention right now or this bad thing wouldn't have been happening to my really fine father, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, right. 
Yeah. Almost anyone who doesn't have a strong religious affiliation, not and I'm and I'm saying religious, you know, not just spiritual, but a religious affiliation, would say, "What in the world would I do with a chaplain?" Right? 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 Yes. They're afraid of being preached at or evangelized. Right. Absolutely. Um, and another is, is guilt, you know, like, oh, man, I haven't been to church in six years, you know, uh, so they'll catch me, right? Uh, um, <clears throat> so there's all these reasons. There are many, many reasons why people who are in incredibly distressed, at a very pivotal point in their lives, who are in great spiritual distress, will say no to the chaplain. And so how do we work with that? What are the things that we can do and what are the ways that we can build systems so that spiritual care is addressed? Very important questions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one of those I wish had been framed different. One of those mm -hmm. is the one that, that spiritual care should be treated the same as any other medical. Mm -hmm. is to mm -hmm. promote the hegemony of mm -hmm. the medical model mm -hmm. as if every mm -hmm. Problem Medical problem, right? Very the, good. The intent of yeah, it, yeah. Right. 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 Absolutely, and I think that I think you're absolutely right, and I think it also emphasizes that if it's a medical problem, then they have a drug to fix it, right? And the goal is to fix it, right? Um, not sit patiently and listen and witness someone suffering, but let's get it over with, right? Yeah. So this uh, this is, again, kind of a busy slide. This comes from Christina Polchowski's work, and, and what uh, this is from an inpatient setting, but what the, the work that she's trying to emphasize is that, that the time, at the point in time where anyone walks into the doors of this medical center, that there should be spiritual screening on admission, and uh, and who and how does that is worked out depending on, you know, who's available and who does what in your setting. But definitely physicians and nurses and chaplains and social workers are all part of this at, at initial screening. And that, but let's say, for example, um, in our, in my own hospital, I can tell you our inpatient hospital, 220 beds are so incredibly overwhelming that in truth, there's not a chaplain in the outpatient clinic most of the time. And so who is going to see this patient in the outpatient setting? It's going to be a nurse or a physician. And so what should the nurse and physician be assessing so that we will then know very importantly, who is the person who most needs to be then to, to get a little more in-depth spiritual history, but who then gets the expert spiritual uh, intervention who really needs to be seen by the board certified chaplain. And again, in my setting, a case in point, uh, and I say this more and more often, I work at a cancer hospital, the City of Hope Cancer Center. I can make the case in my mind that if you are sick enough to be on the grounds of my hospital, you have serious illness and you could use spiritual help, right? That's my belief. Um, there are, on any given day at my hospital, 220 people in the inpatient setting. Again, we all know you have to be pretty sick to make it in the inpatient setting these days, right? Of those 220 people, a whole heck of a lot of them have been through transplant, are still trying to stay alive. A lot of them are in the ICU. Uh, the rest of them are, you know, really sick and going through a lot or they wouldn't be there. So there's that 220 people. But, oh, by the way, there are 600 other people who are in the outpatient clinic today getting chemo, getting radiation, getting follow-up tests, in the clinic seeing their doctor, getting lab work. So today, this very day, there are 820 people at the City of Hope. And there are three chaplains. And so even if those three chaplains happen to be wearing roller skates today and be having a very good day, they're going to see easily less than 5% of the patients who are on my campus, more like 1%. And the point being, if the only people on my campus who are assessing, focused on, interested in, providing spiritual care are those three chaplains, then we have just built a system that is denying spiritual care to the other 98 to 99%. And if instead we built a system where physicians and social workers and nurses had some basic skill in spiritual assessment, 
having a conversation, explaining what a chaplain is, uh, assessing for what is true spiritual distress, knowing how to triage because one of those three busy chaplains really does need to see this patient soon, then we would have a different level of care. So that's what has to happen. And so that's basically what this sort of busy model says is that we have to think about how do people get through our system and what kind of care are we going to provide for them. This is the same thing. It's an outpatient model. And I think we're particularly challenged about how can we do this in the outpatient setting. Uh, the second area is spiritual assessment of patients and families, and so some of the recommendations are things like spiritual screening, assessment tools, that all staff members need to be trained to recognize spiritual distress. So at my hospital, one of the projects right now is that the three chaplains have developed an entire curriculum on training social workers in better spiritual assessment because we have 23 social workers and virtually every patient in our hospital is seen by one of these 23 social workers. So now, can you see how we have broadened the army? You know, we have 23 social workers who have had 12 hours of training by the chaplains and after that classroom 12 hours training have accompanied a chaplain, both observing the chaplain and having the chaplain observe the social worker in doing spiritual assessment. And so we are raising the competence of the staff. Um, <clears throat> We need to have this as part of our routine evaluation. We need formal screening by our chaplains, documentation follow-up, and we need to be able to respond. So we're doing things like this by helping staff. So this is, again, kind of small print here, but what we're basically saying are, what are forms of spiritual distress? Things like a sense of abandonment, anger at God, um, despair and hopelessness, guilt and shame, need for reconciliation, um, and what would that look like? What are the key features from our history? And we've actually, in the last column, this is from another source, but we share this. These are example statements. So what we're trying to say is, Dr. Morgan, you're the medical oncologist that sees all of our ovarian cancer patients, 75% who are diagnosed at late stage disease, a whole lot of them who are 40 and 50 years old and have just been told they're going to die soon. You see a lot of spiritual distress. And so the point is, when the women in your ovarian clinic are saying things to you like, God has abandoned me, I'm not sure God is here with me anymore, I don't deserve to die pain-free, I can't pray anymore, what if all that I believe isn't true? These are things that should be telling you that you need to get the chaplain involved. So do you see the sense is just how do we get every clinician attuned to um, spiritual care? The third important thing is formation of a spiritual treatment plan. And the idea here is we say all the time, we're all very good at pain assessment. The Joint Commission has made sure we are. But it does no good if you walk in the room and say, what is your pain? Oh, it's an eight? Hmm, sorry. Let me go out and write it on the chart, and then we go about our business, right? So you assess only if you intend to do something with the information. And so once we do spiritual assessment, then we should be... <clears throat> Doing the spiritual screening, we should be then integrating what we're finding in the treatment plan, and we're trying to identify ways from the beginning to support, encourage, expression of needs and beliefs. Um, we do that with involvement of spiritual care coordinators, of uh, looking for spiritual support resources, of uh, discharge plans of care, bereavement care, but, but it is with intention that this good care will happen. We need all of our staff to be very good at communication. We need to teach clinicians compassionate presence and at listening. We need help with reflective listening and querying about life events, about supporting patient sources of strength, open-ended questions, query about spiritual beliefs, life review, targeted spiritual interventions, and continued presence and follow-up. Just one little fun example to share. I lead up my program project in lung cancer is an example of a place where we're living this out. Every patient with lung cancer, the day they come to our medical center, is now having a very comprehensive assessment, including spiritual well-being. Every Monday morning, we then meet and discuss every lung cancer patient, including presenting the spiritual assessment. A few weeks ago, we had a patient who was 81 years old. She had lived in the Midwest. She um, said she was an atheist. She had always been an atheist. She was 81 years old and was going to die soon as an atheist. Um, when the nurse went on, though, to say, tell me about your life. Tell me who you are. Tell me what is important to you and what is going to be important to you in these few months ahead. 
the 81 year old woman said, I'll tell you my goal. And that is when I was very, very young, my brother and I had a difficult childhood, but the two of us really bonded. We took care of each other. And every summer we spent most of our summers when we had to be at home and not in school, we spent most of our summers in a tree. We had this tree with a tree house and we lived in this tree. And so as we grew up and we had left home at 18 and both went away, we made a pact. And the pact was that every year of our lives, we would meet back at this family farm, at this family home, and we would climb up the tree together. And it would be our time to reconnect and share our lives, and we climbed up the tree. And every year, every year, that has happened. And so as we were asking her about her functional status and you know things to worry about with her bone mets, et cetera, she said, I'm making that trip in three weeks, and I'm climbing up a tree, right? We were telling her, beware of you know, rugs in the floor and stairs. And she was telling us, get over it, I'm climbing a tree. Uh, <clears throat> so at that point, fortunately, the nurse had said, you know, when the patient said, I'm atheist, then the nurse said, wonderful, you know. I, uh, um, and by the way, every person in this project, you know, every person here is seen by our social worker and chaplain. They're great listeners. They're wonderful people. They'll stop by. Um, it's part of the deal, right? It's part of the package. And so the patient was prepared that that everyone knew she was an atheist and she was going to get the visit from the chaplain. And, of course, when we were, when the nurse is telling the story about the tree, you know, the, the chaplain is bursting, you know, with, oh, I can't wait to see this woman because I can't wait to hear her story about climbing the tree. And I can't wait to give her the opportunity to talk about what it's going to feel like to climb that tree one more time. And, you know, this is going to be wonderful. So that's what good spiritual care looks like for all people. <clears throat> Um, but also uh, simple spiritual therapies are opportunities in an interdisciplinary way to integrate things like uh, visualization for meaningless pain, relaxation, meaning-oriented therapies, narrative medicine, dignity-conserving therapies, um, <clears throat> massage, meditation, books, exercise, journaling. There's so many ways that we can build strong uh, programs. We're sort of running a little short on time, so I'll just kind of uh, clip through the last few things quickly. Um, our next, our fourth recommendation was around interprofessional considerations, roles, and team functioning. And that is that we need to create healing environments. We need documented assessment of patient needs. We need workplace activities to enhance our own spirituality. We need training and certification. How could you put nurses and physicians working with people who are seriously ill and dying in critical care units and oncology units, et cetera, and not fully prepare them for what spiritual care should look like? We need personal and professional development um, in order to do this work. And we need time for self-examination. We need as times for a sense of connectiveness and community, discussion of ethical issues, and, of course, I mentioned before, quality improvement activities specific to spiritual care. Um, this is the GWISH website. It's a great resource for any of you wanting more resources, examples. There's a great video on this site demonstrating a spiritual uh, assessment using the FICA tool. There's information about different faith traditions. So it's just www.gwish.org. Um, I want to end by telling you that when we ended that first project, Fortunately, the funder, uh, Archland Foundation, said this is great that we have these national recommendations. It's great that they've gone forward to the National Quality Forum, et cetera. But we really would like to see them come alive. And so they gave us two additional years of funding. And what we have done with this two years of funding is that we issued a call uh, to hospitals throughout Southern California. We had uh, many applications, but we selected nine hospitals. And each of the nine hospitals were then making a commitment to take those recommendations I just shared and to put them into practice to demonstrate that you really can do um, what we have recommended. Um, the nine hospitals, we focus them on four areas, spiritual assessment, integration of spiritual assessment into the plan of care, education of the clinicians, and quality improvement as sort of priorities. Um, so for the last two years, we've been bringing these nine hospitals together uh, every six months to meet together in person and every month on monthly phone calls for sharing and networking and support. And <clears throat> um, they have all done uh, amazing things 
uh, the goal was that these demonstration projects would be inspiration and models that other people could use for the delivery of spiritual care. I, I don't have a lot of time, but I'll tell you there are amazing things that have come from this. One thing I just want to share is one of our hospitals is the big county hospital, um, County Hospital LA, one of the biggest county hospitals in uh, the United States. And one of the th outcomes of their project is that they found that one of their biggest sources of staff distress is that they have so many homeless people who are brought into the hospital who are then imminently dying and who are dying alone. And these are the John Doe's. These are the patients who not only have no family or support, they have no name. And so they are brought in and the staff see them dying completely alone, unbefriended. And so they've created a volunteer program called By Your Side. It is done in conjunction with one of the local churches. And what they have done is train volunteers so that now there is a call list. And any time a homeless person, or, or it doesn't even need to be a homeless person, perhaps it's an elderly person from a nursing home whose only family member is in the same nursing home, or perhaps it's an elderly person whose only caregiver is their daughter that lives across the country but the idea is no one should die alone and so there are these volunteers the by your side volunteers who then can be called and sit a vigil with the dying patient and one of the great things to share with you is that that program has been so successful they have so many volunteers they have far too many volunteers to meet the needs of county hospital and so now they've reached out and there are i think five other hospitals that are using these by your side volunteers so there i could go on for a a long time there are all kinds of really impressive amazing things that these hospitals are doing despite the very difficult resources so just to conclude we believe that spiritual care is essential to improving the quality of palliative care that there are many studies that have identified the strong desire of patients um, to have spirituality included in their care recommendations are provided about implementing spiritual care across settings we need our chaplains, uh, regular ongoing assessment of spiritual needs, integration into the treatment plan, professional education, and adopting these into uh, clinical sites. We believe that clinical sites can integrate spiritual care models in their programs, into their training. We need to engage with community clergy, promote professional development, and develop accountability measures to ensure that spiritual care is fully integrated in the care of our patients. So we're right at the end of time, but maybe a minute or two, if there's any last questions or comments from anyone, I uh, welcome your feedback. 